saying that he does not want to delay the election but expressed apprehensions that counting of mailed ballots could take weeks and hamper the results leading to a compromised poll his suggestion was immediately criticized by leaders of the opposition the democratic party meanwhile biden's supporters have also announced a launch of outreach in 14 languages to influence the indian american community in the big picture we will analyze the upcoming us elections joining me on the program today are prabhu dayal former ambassador preeti upala foreign editor of the observer california and kv prasad senior associate editor of the tribune thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of the big picture all right uh, preeti let me start the program with you first let's first try and understand and analyze of course this is the final stretch of the election in the us what is the sense on the ground well thank you mr pereira for having me on your show uh this is the most extraordinary election in us history in in on the one hand it's a very important election but on the other it's incredibly subdued i think the most ever in, in the entire history uh foreign policy is actually going to end up being the uh, heart of this election i think with the uh with the covid crisis and the dwindling economy president trump has no choice but to now push the foreign policy agenda he will make uh, china the central focus uh in the months leading up to the election uh, and in this regard he actually will have a lot of support not just from his base but also from uh across the country because recent polls have shown the distrust and the disdain that the american public has shown uh towards china vis-a-vis the pandemic so this actually uh works nicely for him on the contrary uh with the um uh, candidate uh, biden uh, he finds himself kind of on the back foot so to speak because uh, he him i you know uh, it's i think the public would just be him and his party being a little weaker on national security because that's not really uh, an agenda item that they pushed on and they know that with his own son's links to uh, china and various other companies he is not going to take china to task so analysts are also saying that trump will actually have a uh, an upper hand so to speak uh, i mean of course we've had these the violent protests and riot now sadly they have been weaponized and politicized uh in some way by either party but definitely by the the democratic party i would say and uh, moving closer to the election i actually predict more of these violent protests and uh, you know i think from mid october on on words uh, it's going to be sort of very uh, vulnerable challenging times uh, but in some way if president trump can get his base to really rally up and uh, come out and vote because it does seem that there will be a vote regardless of whether people want it or not uh, he might find himself in a precarious situation while uh, that um, he, he might be reelected so it's uh, we shall see the only point i also want to make is that i wouldn't be taking the exit polls for the election very seriously because remember in 22nd right up to the day before the election it was a 90% in favor of hillary and we all know how that turned out so i think these are very very exciting times it's uh, really sort of a uh, you know a luck of the draw so to speak so uh, i'm just as excited as everybody else to to find out the fate absolutely okay all right quite a few uh... you know aspects brought in there by uh, preeti upala of course the protests china and everything that's been happening between the united states and china and of course the pandemic that the entire world is witnessing and is suffering and also subdued campaigning kv prasad this is the aspect that i want to take up with you now in 2016 we saw a very heated campaign between hillary clinton and uh, you know donald trump this time around it seems far more subdued you know uh, uh the campaigning is the rhetoric is not that high what's different this time around do you think well i think uh, if you look at the, the fact that coronavirus and the pandemic has really resulted in uh, an outreach in terms of real campaigning that used to happen the traditional manner so parties and our uh, campaigns are trying to fill uh, around this reality they don't really need to have the numbers you can't have in your town hall the way they used to have 
so much so the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention, which are going to happen later this month, the numbers are far, far reduced because of the pandemic and social distancing norms. So that is one reason why everybody is trying to find out how best we can do the outreach. Secondly, I would say that while the campaign looks subdued right now, but just like wait for the conventions to get over because we have, we have what, 88 days from today, number third being the election day. Uh, and the real uh, campaign and the, when the presidential debates start taking place and the truth begins, that's when you will see the rolling out, each one trying to stick charges against the other, take down each other on issues, uh, some of the issues that are already flagged on the program. So this will be really the outcome. It is subdued, yes, for the time being, but as you enter the home stretch once the convention is over, you'll, you'll see a very different kind of a campaign mode. Right. All right, Ambassador, let me bring you into the picture now. So what are the other factors that are likely to influence the elections? We've been through at least three or four. What do you think is going to be one of the key factors? And what are some of the other factors that are likely to influence the polls? Well, I would like to take on whatever has been already said by the earlier two panelists in the sense that the three vital issues which are going to figure in this election are firstly coronavirus, secondly the economy and thirdly foreign policy particularly as regards China. Now President Trump has been blamed by the Democrats for mishandling the coronavirus situation. There are 4.8 million cases in the United States today and there have been more than 159,000 deaths and people are crying foul of this whole matter and Trump is being blamed for having been very very careless in regard to handling the epidemic when it started. Secondly, the economy has hit everybody. The economy is really in a bad shape in the United States, but of course, it is also so in many other parts of the world. Now, Trump has promised to cut taxes. In contrast, Biden has promised a $3 trillion package and has offered to raise the minimum wage. So they are pandering to different sections of the American electorate. Of course, their focus on China as the evil player in this entire situation is going to be very much there. Biden had been known to be in favor of a comprehensive dialogue with China, but now his position seems to be a weakening in this regard. He's changing his position and he is beginning to take a tougher position as regards human rights violations in China. Even in regard to Taiwan, he has become more equivocal. So I think that in this sort of a situation where everything is going to be virtual. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there is not so much of a human, you know, fanfare, excitement about the elections. This is because uh, of the coronavirus related situation. Everything is, is virtual. The um, conventions of the two political parties would be virtual. And for this reason, they, things are subdued. But it doesn't mean that public anger is not there. There is a certain degree of anger with uh, President Trump and the Republicans. Even within the Republican Party, there is a sort of a divide on this in this regard. So to come back to my central point, the three major issues which will feature during the run-up to the November 3rd electorate would be coronavirus, the economy, and China. Mind you, on November 3rd, we will only be electing the voters, the Electoral College, but then the final vote would take place in December when the Electoral College itself will vote. Of course, the Electoral College will vote as per its party affiliations. But technically, on November 3rd, we will only be witnessing the election of the Electoral College in the United States. All right, then let me take the point that uh, one of the points that uh, the ambassador was making forward with you, uh, Preeti, you know, and given your uh, you know background in investment banking, let's talk about the economy and how much of an impact the economic condition in the United States is likely to have job losses and all of these things have been taking place over the last few months. How much of a, uh, you know, uh, how much is it playing on the minds of the electorate? 
I, I don't think uh, we've ever seen a situation when the economy has played or will play such a big role uh, in any election. Now, sadly, we this pandemic um, uh, has had irreversible effects on the U.S. economy. The uh, second quarter uh, data has just come in, and I think we've had maybe the worst quarter in history. This is worse than the depression of the 19 of the late 1920s. Uh, the decline of the second quarter GDP is about 33 percent, which is uh, more than it's ever been, and uh, the unemployment currently sits at 11 percent. I actually fear it's uh, higher than 11 percent, but the official record says 11 percent. And with the unemployment uh, benefits slowly, uh, or quickly rather, evaporating, I think the U.S. finds itself in a really, really tight situation economically. This obviously will play on the minds of uh, the voters. Uh, and I personally predict a recession and possibly a depression in the following years to come. Uh, that's a big claim to make, but I just feel like all the signs are there and it's very unfortunate that this would be the case. Um, it, it, I think nobody had expected that a health crisis would stop the world economy in the way that it has and uh, completely affect uh, you know, uh, democracies and, and governments and even elections around the world. Uh, my fear is that more people will end up dying because of financial and economic reasons than the actual health crisis itself. Because it, when you look at the actual numbers, uh, I mean, the analysts will say it's what 1% fatality rate, which is very low. But the way that everything has just been halted, I, I don't think it's very, uh, very healthy at all. It's the uh, cases of... Uh, mental depression, suicide, uh, and mental health, I think, are increasing around the world, but especially here, where there's already an opioid addiction, and people are already, I mean, healthcare is the, the weakest, uh, the, you know, wicked of, of, of the United States in many ways. So uh, if the future does not look good. Uh, however, I think it's uh, up to both candidates to somehow uh, persuade the, uh, the voters uh, into trusting them that they still would do a better job than the other. So I don't know how far they'll go in that, but sadly the economy is going to play a huge role and it's not looking pretty uh, down the future. Let me bring in another aspect now. We've spoken about the economy. Let's talk about this major, uh, you know, Black Lives uh, Matter movement that has taken place all over the world. KV Prasad, the George Floyd death and the aftermath and on the movement that we've seen, not just in the United States, but the rest of the world. How big an issue is that? How much of, a, uh, how much of it is playing on the minds of the voters? And is law and order, uh, you know, as a situation as a whole, a problem in the United States? Well, of course, uh, we see three strands emerging out of the crisis uh, which happened in Minneapolis. One, of course, straight away was defunding the police. That became a big issue for a while. Uh, there was a big uh, difference of opinion as to how this, that needs to be handled. That has uh, come down to a certain extent. The temperatures on that have uh, gone down to a bit. But the Portland crisis has come in. The way uh, uh, American president has used the federal police or federal force in various aspects is already reaching out. It's standing out a debate in a different kind. Uh, the Black Lives Matter has, remember, probably that is one reason why uh, we are now talking of... Uh, the American presumptive president, the Democratic uh, Party president, uh, Joe Biden, looking at one, he has said he's going to take a woman as a partner uh, to the, uh, on the ticket. So we have three names, six names going around. Uh, they happen to be a Jamaican American, Indian American, a Europe, like say, Kamala Harris name is thrown wrong, Ben Brenner. So we have a series of names which have been talked about. So all these are outreach. Uh, a messaging has to be sent across. But I think this has gone beyond just politics because it has changed the way. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've been there and I've seen the manner in which the hill works. But the way in which this uh, post uh, Minneapolis event, the things have changed, uh, the drift has stopped in a way. I think that's, uh, that's something which is really amazing. I have seen for such a long time. 
All right. Uh, so let me bring in another aspect in as well. All right. We've got 30 minutes, uh, so it's a short duration. Can't keep, uh, you know, we'll have to try and get in as many aspects as possible. I'm going to go back to a point that uh, Priti Upala was making during her opening remarks, something that you touched upon as well, Ambassador. The, uh, you know, the ties between Washington and Beijing have, uh, have reached a low really over the recent past. Is that really going to matter to the American on the ground who's going to go and vote? To some extent, it no doubt will. And that is why both the candidates are going hammer and tongs at China. You know, Trump has announced that he wants TikTok to sell away its unit here in the United States and it will, he, it will stop functioning there unless it is bought over by an American unit. Biden, on his part, had called the Chinese thugs. He had said that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is a thug for having a million Uyghurs in reconstruction camps, which he meant, you know, the detention camps. So both the candidates have been going very, very hard at China because I think it does matter to convey that they are prepared to be tough where China is concerned. You know, there is a grow, growing concern that China has taken away American jobs, that China has adversely affected the American economy, that China is playing a negative role in global affairs. So it does seem quite relevant for both the presidents to take a tough line towards China at this particular juncture. Now, once they're elected, what the line will be would make may be different and that would be uh, that would remain to be seen because policies evolve and presidents sometimes revisit whatever they have said during their electioneering but at the moment there is no doubt that pro projecting china as uh, as an evil power and taking a tough stance towards china does suit their electoral policies and thus fit in with the dynamics of the global situation. President Trump has praised India for being tough with China because uh, in his view, and which is shared widely, uh, it is important to stand up to the Chinese, whether it is in terms of technology or whether it is in terms of geopolitics, whether it relates to Ladakh or whether it relates to the South China Sea. So I think uh, the point that uh, uh, President Trump is is making is very much the same as the Australians have been making or as uh, we have been making that it is important to stand up to a country like China because otherwise it is trying to swamp its way all over and it's imposing neo-colonialism on much of the world. So I, I think the China factor is going to be quite significant in the discussions relating to the U.S. presidential elections. Time now to take the discussion forward and bring in some more aspects. Let's talk about, uh, you know, Indian Americans, Preeti Upala. What does this election mean for the Indian Americans and the bilateral relationship between <laughs> India and the United States as a whole? We seem to be seeing both the Democrats and the Republicans trying to lure, uh, you know, the Indian Americans and trying to, you know, uh, trying to uh, you know, like like uh, K.V. Prasad said, uh, you know, the Joe Biden is trying to look at an in, in, Indo-American vice president running mate, you know, whether he actually chooses uh, uh, an Indian-American still remains to be seen. But clearly, overtures are being made to the Indian community. So, uh, at 4 million, Indian-Americans obviously make up only a very tiny uh, voting or electoral uh, group, let's say. Uh, however, I think this is one time where they will be more influential and I think their voice will be uh, heard uh, more and it will matter more and because of their increasing um, ability to uh, support financially candidates and just voice out their uh, you know, preference uh, digitally as well as through word of mouth. I, I personally think Indian Americans are stuck between a rock and a hard place during this election. On the one hand, I think they align with the, the values espoused by the Democratic Party, you know, freedom, liberty, liberal values. Um, and traditionally, obviously, they voted 
a Democrat, almost 80 percent of Indians usually vote uh, Democrat in the in the previous couple of elections. Uh, however, the recent uh, stance that the certain factions of the DNC and just the party in general has taken towards uh, some of the actions of the government of India, uh, such as the abrogation of Article 370 and now the recently passed uh, CAA Act, has um, sort of uh, riled up the community because I think they've taken an antagonistic position towards a major ally. And I don't think the community is taking this very kindly. They feel, some parts of the community feel this as an attack directly on them. And, uh, you know, you mentioned overtures. I think uh, President Trump is somebody who's uh, out and out booing the Indian American community. We've seen that he obviously shares the great, great chemistry with, with uh, Prime Minister Modi. But when you look at the, the Democratic Party, uh, even on Biden's uh, official election manifesto, uh, the, his sort of what he wants to do for the Indian American community is somewhere at the very, very bottom. And in fact, he has been recently pandering to large you know, groups of other religious minorities uh, at the agony of the, the Indian community because they feel that he's not calling out uh, atrocious act, uh, human rights activities that are happening in our neighborhood. Um, so I actually see a divide between the Indian community. I will. I see a shift. Mo more people will move center, and I think many will move right. Trust me, there are concerted efforts. There's a lot of Indian groups uh, online that are really excited about uh, pushing the pro-Trump um, bandwagon. So I think this will not be as skewed as it was before. How skewed um, uh, or, or how much the shift will be is will remain to be seen, but it will not be an 80% like it's been in the past. This much I can say for sure. Okay. All right. KV Prasad, you know, we've discussed several issues now over the last 25 minutes or so, but at the end of the day, do you believe that it is just going to come down to the swing states? Because that's how we've seen elections being decided in the past. Well, well, that of course matters a lot because the battleground states are known. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think if I peruse the report this morning, papers from the U.S., I, I did realize that uh, the, the Trump uh, campaign and, uh, people are looking at the states where the, the, the uh, battleground states and where they can swing states and where even this, uh, the points that Friedman mentioned on the Indian Americans, some of them who voted uh, the Democrats last time, half they can kind of bring them over. So this isn't, while the numbers may be less, but the, the everything matters when the numbers add up. Because one thing, which is a bane of American politics as much as another, is, is getting the voter out. That has been an issue all the time. I think one of the highest turnout came at the time when Obama worked out, worked out kind of worked this campaign out. So this has been an issue. Uh, we have to see many factors are there and the kind of say, and with the kind of controversy over the mailing of ballots going on right now. Uh, these are all factors that will add on to it, but yes, uh, there are issues on table. And I think one issue that India and Indian Americans would always like to look at is uh, what's going to happen on the H1B and the immigration issue, because that's something which is, again, on the table. If you look at it, what does in terms of the latest executive order. You know, on this particular point, Ambassador, I'd like to bring you in because there's so much that is said about you know, running a free and fair election in the United States. We saw what happened last time around as well. You know, Russians were blamed. There is a deep concern about this issue. Don't you think that this, do you believe that this issue is going to be another major issue this time around? Well, we'll have to wait and see uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, foreign influences are bound to be at play in a major election like this, but whether they can have any decisive role remains to be seen. Now, there was a little mention a while back about the Indian American community. I agree that its numbers are not large, but then about 1.3 million Indian Americans are expected to be voting this year. And they are in a sizable presence in some of the biggest states of the United States, California, Texas, Florida, New York, Illinois, Pennsylvania, 
Ohio, Georgia. These are some of the biggest states in terms of the number of delegates they have for the Electoral College. And the presence of the Indian American community in these places is quite significant. And that is why uh, the Indian American community is watching with great interest whether Kamala Harris will be selected by Joe Biden as his vice presidential nominee, whether she'll be on the ticket with him. Uh, this assumes significance because uh, whatever the number of the Indian Americans, this factor could play a role in attracting the Indian American vote. The relationship between Trump and Prime Minister Modi is warm. And of course, uh, it has become warmer as time has elapsed. Uh, the Howdy Modi event was very significant. Then Namaste Trump here in India. But surprisingly, this has not held back Trump from taking some tough steps against India, whether it concerns H-1B visas or whether it concerns tariffs on steel and aluminium products or taking India out of the GSP preferred list. Now, whether the India factor will play a role in his elections or not remains to be seen. But there is no doubt about the fact that the China factor will, because China is increasingly regarded by American politicians as a menace, and there is no division on this count. And that is why both President Trump and uh, candidate uh, uh, Biden have been going very hard at China. Now, one last point that I would like to make is that in America, it is the system of winner take all in most states except Maine and Nebraska. That is to say, if the electoral college votes are more in favor of one party, then that party gets the entire number of seats which the electoral college gives to that particular state. This factor is going to be very, very interesting because we'll have to keep an eye on how the parties are faring in the respective states between now and the 3rd of November. And I think Preeti will bear me out on this, that the conventions will be virtual in nature, but will still be extremely interesting because they will determine how uh, the swing states and the big states will be voting in this year's presidential election. All right. Uh, there's time to get one last comment on the program. Preeti, close the show for us with what to expect in the next three months in the lead up to November 3rd. Um, I just to uh, add on to what everyone has said, regardless of uh, whichever way the election goes, I think the largest democracy in the world and the uh, oldest democracy in the world ought to work together. So one way or another, uh, we hope to take this relationship further. Unfortunately, uh, as far as the next three months are concerned, I don't see it being a pretty sight. I uh, predict that the uh, uh, protests uh, will get more violent in nature and they will increase leading up to the election. I think Somewhere between uh, somewhere in mid October onwards, you can see this happening. Um, you know, this is I think America is searching for its soul right now. Uh, this is a nation that is very divided, and they really uh, uh, should find uh, something within themselves to come together. And uh, you know, they do love uh, this country. There is incredible pride, and they find themselves in uh, an interesting situation right now. So uh, I, you know, uh, let's hope that um, uh, the election actually boosts the morale uh, of the uh, of the uh, voters. OK, all right. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us.